everyone. My name is Steve Pardue, one of the managing members here at Elevate Oral Care. Our speaker today is Dr. Jeanette McLean. Dr. McLean is a diplomat of American Board of Pediatric Dentistry, fellow of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, owner of Affiliated Children's Dental Specialist in Glendale, Arizona, and mother of two. She received her dental degree with honors from the University of Southern California in 2003 and completed her specialty training in pediatric dentistry in 2005 at Sunrise Children's Hospital hospital through the University of Nevada School of Medicine. Dr. McLean has become an internationally recognized advocate and expert on minimally invasive dentistry, appearing in newspapers, magazines, television, and continuing education lectures. Most notably, she was featured in the July 2016 New York Times article, A Cavity Fighting Liquid Helps Kids Avoid Dentist Drills, which brought national attention to the option of treating cavities non-invasively with silver diamine fluoride. It's an honor to have Dr. McLean, such an expert in the field, share her knowledge with us and her experience, and we're pleased to have her here today. Dr. McLean, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm honored to, to be here today. Thank you to everyone who has tuned in to the webinar. Um, I understand we're all going through really unprecedented times, and I'm very grateful to the folks at Elevate Oral Care for putting together these um, webinar series. Uh, they've certainly been very helpful to me, and, and I hope that the information that I share with you today is, is helpful to you. Um, and on that note, let's go ahead and get, get started. Uh, so today we're going to talk about smart dentistry or, or uh, restorative options that are minimally invasive. And as was already noted, I, I am a pediatric dentist. Uh, in Arizona, I've been in practice since 2005 and became part owner of my practice in 2007. And just uh, as far as disclosures, I don't have any owner interest or stock in any of the products or companies mentioned today. Um, I have received speaking honorariums in the past from various um, dental meetings and organizations, universities, dental conferences, um, including uh, unrestricted educational grants from Elevate Oral Care, Oral Science, uh, GC America, DMG America, New Smile, and Dry Shield. Um, however, none of them have any input in the content of the presentation. I'm a huge supporter of organized dentistry. Uh, I feel that now, perhaps more than ever before, it's so important for us to support organized dentistry in whatever capacity we can, whether that's just through our membership or if we're able to participate uh, on a state or even national level in the various committees that they have. But we really need our um, strength in numbers, I suppose, is, is the way that you would say it, but just to help advocate for our profession, especially now when um, uh, like I said, these are unprecedented times. Um, <clears throat> and just a shout out to my husband, who's now homeschooling our two kiddos. You can see on the left there, that's Charlie and Sabrina. They're now eight and 10. And this this has been hard on them as well. It's hard, been hard on all of us. It's uh, strange times. Um, and I just like to also acknowledge I'm, I'm a big supporter of humanitarian efforts to share our time and talents with others uh, whenever we're, we're able to. It's such a rewarding uh, thing to do. And needless to, this, to say, these are, are strange times. Um, and this is one of my thoughts I had the other night where um, I said, I had another one of those moments where for a brief second, I thought I'd go to bed and it'd be a, a normal day tomorrow. Uh, but alas, uh, it's not. COVID-19 is here. Uh, this is my practice after we had shut down uh, per ADA uh, recommendations. And it's, just, it's a sad and eerie feeling to, to look at the office. Even at the beginning, when we started clearing out toys and clearing out the magazines. And, uh, but then when it was completely empty, I mean, we are open to, to see emergencies. But um, yeah, it's just an odd feeling. And I, I miss my work family. Um, I miss my patients. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm eager to, to get back. But you know, the unknown and the uncertainty, it, it, it's stressful. Uh, more recently, I have been, been um, become known for being an advocate of minimally invasive dentistry, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and just as a disclaimer, I am a clinician. 
as I said, I'm in private practice and I do consider myself a forever student. I think we need to be humble and recognizing that we didn't learn it all in dentistry, dental school or residency for those of us that, that specialized or in hygiene school or, or, or our, our formal education really is just the beginning uh, because science is ever evolving. People also will question you know, why I am so passionate about this particular topic. So I do like to share um, that there are a few key life events that change the way that I practice. One was, of course, becoming a mom, that becoming a parent will change anybody. Uh, but to be more specific, my daughter had surgery under general anesthesia when she was nine months old. So that had a dramatic impact on the way that I emphasize with parents during the informed consent discussion particularly when and if I was recommending sedation for their child's dental treatment. I also experienced a medical emergency with an IV sedated patient in my practice. Uh, I was a young boy with autism. Uh, he recovered, he's fine, he still comes to see me every three months, he still gets caries. <laughs> uh, so, th But the point is that moment really, it, it was like a wake up call for me to look at what I was doing and, and the risks associated with it compared to the treatment that I was actually rendering. Uh, and just my general observations that the more aggressive interventions, like what I had learned in residency, did not equate to, to did not necessarily equate to improved oral health in the long term. So it just made me question what I could do differently and what I could do better for my patients and for their, their families. And part of that was just acknowledging the fact that I would never be able to drill my way out of a behavior-driven biofilm disease. Hopefully we can all be humble in recognizing that. You know, the treatments we do, while they are beneficial and they're important and we're always going to need to do them. Heck, when we come back from quarantine, we might have to do more <laughs> for a while. I don't know how who else has been stress eating and snacking all day. Uh, or I, I people have been posting pictures of the empty toilet paper aisle and then the toothpaste aisle is fully stocked. Uh, but but anyhow, the, the, the point being that the, the treatments we do, they don't cure the disease itself. You know, restorative dentistry doesn't address the bacteria excuse me, the bacteria or the behavior, it's, it's treating the, the symptoms of the disease, i.e. the hole in the tooth. And as a pediatric dentist, what's particularly concerning to me is the fact that gold standard OR GA pediatric dentistry has relapse rates anywhere between 20 and 80%. Uh, and I'm sure any pediatric dentist out there, you've, you've seen this yourself, where you, you take a kid to the OR and then 6, 12, 18 months later, they have new teeth coming in and they have new lesions or, or, or recurrent caries on the teeth that you already treated. So it, it's frustrating. This is a, a rather sobering article from 2015 from the AAPD journal where they looked at the evidence of effectiveness of current therapies to prevent and treat early childhood caries. And they concluded that there's lack of substantial evidence to suggest that restorative treatment leads to acceptable long-term clinical outcomes. Ooh. And there's certainly a need to go beyond drill and fill dentistry and integrate other concepts of disease management to ensure long-term success. There were also a number of highly publicized sedation-related deaths of, of ch children undergoing dental treatment, uh, which had national attention. Uh, for example, there was a, a program on the Today Show that really didn't put us in a, in a favorable light, which is, which is really frustrating. Uh, and that led to this New York Times article looking at whether kids should be sedated for dental work, which I felt was more of a fair portrayal where it, it explained difference in training, it explained the difference in level of sedation, uh, etc. And, and the comment that I had for this article was that anyone can work on a patient who is knocked out, which is true. <laughs> um, but you know, I feel like behavior management is a dying art form. You know, one of the perhaps the greatest skills of a pediatric dentist is the behavior management aspect, um, and just knowing that if people are not given different options um, to consider getting a second opinion. But of course, there's always gonna be a need for sedation and general anesthesia in our profession. Unfortunately, some of these kids are getting to us when it's too late. Um, but the more that we could 
reduce or delay or altogether avoid sedation, uh, the better. So minimally invasive treatment options are increasing in public awareness, popularity, and demand. You know, whether we like it or not, today's parents are online. They're, they're researchers and they tend to go online for their advice versus asking family and friends or even taking our advice as, as a professional, which can be incredibly frustrating for all of us, I, I, I know. Uh, but it, it is a reality that, that we are dealing with now. And, and now in this COVID-19 world, what are going to be the new worries that they have? You know, parents go online and they worry about sedation or they worry about fluoride or, you know, the materials we use. And now, or now we have this new concern or threat uh, with uh, COVID-19 and how it's transmitted and how contagious it is. And, 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 and now we're questioning if our PPE is, is adequate for this particular novel virus. Um, we know aerosol has always been around and what we do. We, we know that, um, but you know, what will our new normal look like when we finally get back to our practices? Uh, this is a colleague in, in Texas doing emergency treatment. You know, are, are we going to, to need this uh, in, in a short term or a long term? I, I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> it looks pretty hot and expensive, but you know, until we get a, a handle on this this virus, I, it it is it's yet to be seen. I, I I feel that there will probably be some permanent change in our PPE. What that is is, is yet to be seen. But if you think of pre 1980s, pre uh, HIV, and you think back to dental school, like I rem remember being in dental school in 1999 and seeing images like this of, of dentistry being done without gloves. Uh, and, and that was the normal in the early 80s and, and before, you know, 70s, et cetera. And I just remember being grossed out by the bare hands and like the hairy fingers. <laughs> uh, or like, look at this, no mask, no protective eyewear on the assistant uh no gloves so you know i i wonder what we look back at this and think ew right but i wonder what will we one day go back to seeing what we looked like on march 1st 2020 and think ew <laughs> are we gonna look like this I, I don't know i i i don't know uh and that's part of the frustration is is the uncertainty so learning and innovation go hand in hand. The arrogance of success is to think that what you did yesterday will be sufficient for tomorrow. So in this time of, of social distancing and quarantine, um, you know, my, my hope for, for us as a profession and my personal goal is to try to use this time as constructively as possible to continue my dental education through reading and, and, and watching webinars. There's been so many opportunities, which has been great. Um, but I, I hope we all take this time to, to uh, further our, our understanding of, of the disease that we treat um, and hopefully be uh, better <laughs> uh, when we get back. Uh, so hopefully we can all collectively take time to reflect and introspect on what we could do differently and what we could do better as uh, oral health care professionals. Um, so specific to the topic of adopting more minimally invasive interventions, there, there are various components that need to come into play. Uh, of course, paramount is the evidence. You know, we want to do evidence-based treatments for our patients. Uh, and then we also have to look at what, what is happening in organized dentistry and academia, um, and what is patient awareness and demand, whether we like it or not, that, that's a component, <laughs> that's a driving force. And sort of the elephant in the room is the economics. You know, it's okay to, to acknowledge that that is concerning. You know, I still have a student loan payment to pay back. Uh, it's not all federal. <laughs> I, don't, I don't just get to wave it. Um, 
but you know, we there is concern, especially when we talk about what does new PPE look like. Some of the concerns I've seen people voice out there is like, oh my gosh, I can't afford all of that when I'm getting, you know, I I happen to take Medicaid in my practice and I'm already getting, you know, sometimes I'm doing treatment at at a loss when you when you factor in our extremely high overhead and when you're being reimbursed, you know, 30, 40 cents on the dollar for procedure that, you know, if if my PPE is going to be exponentially more per patient it, it is concerning and it's it's okay to acknowledge that the economics uh, is a component and a concern that's just the reality so <clears throat> let's look specific at the uh, evidence so we do have now uh, evidence-based clinical practice guideline and policy statement from the APD regarding the use of silver diamine fluoride um, the ADA released their first ever evidence-based clinical practice guideline in the fall of, of 2018, uh, which included uh, re recommendations for the use of silver diamine fluoride. Uh, and silver diamine fluoride can be very effective uh, in pediatric dentistry, in particular in, in these anterior lesions that are open to saliva and easier to keep clean. Um, it can be even a standalone treatment, you know, if aesthetically, if it's not, if it's not concerning to the, to the parent. Um, and it can even be successful on extensive <laughs> lesions. You know, this is an example of a second opinion I did uh, three years ago. And the patient came from another practice on the other side of town uh, where they were being strongly urged to do IV sedation uh, and restorative dentistry as soon as possible or risk sepsis, um, which really freaked the parents out. And they went on online and did some research as, as far as alternatives to doing the IV sedation and they found uh, silver diamine fluoride. And then that's how they ended up at my office. Uh, but what's interesting here is that both parents were actually physicians. You know, so sometimes those Google MDs are actually MDs and they do know the difference in quality of, of evidence. Um, now in this particular patient, I applied SDF a, a total of four times. So at the initial exam, um, about a month later, and then I went to a six month and, and after it had been applied four times, these lesions were shiny and hard. You could even see, I like to call it the line in the sand <laughs> where the teeth erupted more. Uh, and you could see that healthy unaffected enamel er erupting. So to me, this was arrested and, and that was the end of it. Aesthetically, they weren't bothered by the look of the teeth. So this, this was the ultimate treatment. Now, when he goes off to kindergarten or, or becomes concerned cosmetically, I could certainly do other treatments, but for now, this is all that was, was done. <clears throat> um, so he's one of the ones I, <laughs> you know, now that we can't see anyone except for, for true emergencies, I, I look forward to, to getting him back and getting new uh, x-rays and photographs. Uh, now, I do have resources available online that are free downloads on uh, my practice website, which is kidsteethembraces.com. So I created this chairside guide, which shows before and after images of SDF-treated teeth, along with the pros and cons, and the fact that the, this is the patient's disease. You know, they, they need to... to to participate actively in, in controlling the disease with proper diet and, and oral hygiene. Um, but it's, it's extremely important that all dental providers, so whether it's a dentist or a hygienist or an assistant or, and <laughs> the insurance companies or the policy makers, they have to understand that SDF is a, is a treatment for caries. It is not a cure-all. It is not a one and done magical pixie dust. That would be awesome, but it is not. <laughs> so case in point, uh, here's a extracted abscessed primary molar that was treated with SDF only for two years because that particular parent was so opposed to anything else. They didn't want any sort of restorative dentistry done. They wanted minimally invasive only. And I told this mom that the tooth would do better with a hall crown. You know, proximal lesions on primary molars well into the dentin, those are the least likely to stop with SDF alone, especially if diet and hygiene don't uh, improve. And at one time, this lesion was all dark 
<laughs> and then just look at how you can see all the active lighter carries all around it nice and soft and mushy um, so no it's not a not a cure-all and there are uh, areas that tend to arrest um, or, or excuse me are more predictable at arresting with SDF alone such as primary incisors because they're more open lesions as, as I mentioned earlier and then there's areas where are less likely to arrest which are proximal uh, molar surfaces just because you don't have the lesions open to the flow of saliva and you can't easily ex access them to, to clean uh, the plaque and biofilm off or clean the food out. So Dr. Graham Craig did a great job of uh, identifying these areas in his handbook. You can purchase this online. It's dentaloutlook.com.au. Dr. Graham Craig introduced the concept of treating caries in apprehensive patients in a minimally in, or non-invasive atraumatic fashion uh, using silver fluoride and uh, glass ionomer restoratives. And Dr. Jeremy Horse had an awesome webinar. Uh, it was the second of this series where he looked at this in, in more detail. So if you haven't had a chance yet to check out Dr. Horse's webinar, please be sure to, to do that. Uh, I also highly recommend if you haven't yet had a chance to watch Dr. Matt Allen's webinar on motivational interviewing, that is outstanding as well because it, it it's getting back to the, the root of the, the disease process, the behaviors um, contributing to, to or fueling the, this chronic biofilm disease. So I highly recommend to, to use those resources. And while you're in, in quarantine, excuse me, uh, this is a great article that I wish would be required reading for all dental health professionals, uh, oral health professionals, looking at the oral microbiome and just understanding that there will always be bacteria. So some of these old fashioned notions of like eliminating all bacteria it is completely irrational. So there, there will always be bacteria uh, <laughs> which can be good and bad, right? There's good and bad bacteria. We certainly are understanding that more with respects to our gut health, right? And, and people are becoming more aware of the benefits of probiotics, et, et cetera. But, but uh, likewise in our mouth, <laughs> which is the beginning of the GI tract, right? Uh, caries is, is a dysbiosis. It's an imbalance in our, our biofilm, okay? So it is now known that surgical intervention of dental caries alone does not stop the disease process. Additionally, many lesions do not progress and tooth restorations have a finite longevity. Therefore, modern management of dental caries should be more conservative. This coming from our, our AAPD guideline on caries. Uh, and this is an outstanding uh, piece by Dr. Margarita Fontana in uh, the ADA journal in November of 2018 where she talked about caries management for the modern age, improving practice one guideline at a time. Of course, this coming just one month after that first evidence-based clinical practice guideline was released by the ADA. Uh, so bear with me as I read this here, but I think it's really important. Although extensive efforts have been made to teach and perform caries management under a minimally invasive, that is non-invasive and micro-invasive approach that emphasizes clinical and public health preventive services, the drill and fill approach may still remain predominant in some settings, neglecting to fully address the underlying disease process. Over the years, experts in the field of cariology conceptualized that caries acts as a recurrent disease cycle that involves varied states of demineralization and remineralization over a patient's lifespan. This concept is the crux of modern day caries management, a patient-centered risk-based philosophy that prioritizes prevention, early detection, and non-invasive and micro-invasive treatments. And this is how they've staged out the evidence-based guidelines that the AEPD will release over the, the next few years. Uh, the first being, of course, the non-restorative guidelines, which happen to have included SDF. So I'm looking forward to that. And it's not like this is new information. <laughs> it's just that we aren't necessarily following the evidence. Uh, so this is a 2008 paper from the ADA 
journal, a critical review, where they concluded that there is substantial evidence that removing all vestiges of infected dentin from lesions approaching the pulp is not required for caries management. Okay. Now, if you have an abscess tooth, obviously that is not the case. So, so don't, don't get confused here. I'm talking about otherwise vital, healthy pulp. It, it's not necessary to, to completely remove all caries to manage it. And there we have a 2013 Cochrane review uh, showing that stepwise and partial excavation reduced the incidence of pulp exposure in symptomless, vital, carious primary as well as permanent teeth. Therefore, these techniques show clinical advantage over complete caries removal in the management of dental caries. Now, this is the FDI guide. I know in Dr. Horst's excellent webinar, he showed the ADA guide that was similar to this. Um, I like the, the uh, images on this FDI guide. Now, FDI is essentially global de organized dentistry. So ADA is it participates in, in, in FDI. But this is their guideline on when to actually intervene surgically. So you can look from, from zero to four, non-cavitated, you can do secondary prevention, i.e. non-surgical. And it's not until you actually see the cavitation, so a five or a six, that we should be doing the tertiary prevention, i.e. the surgical drill and fill intervention. Okay. Now, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> if I see a four and the patient can tolerate it, let's say I don't have to sedate them or, 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 the, or they're cooperative, etc., I some I will sometimes open that up, <laughs> you know, shh, don't tell the FDI, but technically you could seal that with glass and I'll show you some examples where I did do that um, and, and you can arrest that lesion and it would not uh, progress. So when you are considering whether to remove carious tissue in your pediatric patients, evidence-based research suggests that you should make your clinical decision based on hardness and not on a tooth discoloration. So just because something is dark does not mean we need to, to drill it out. You know, if you, I think back to what I learned in dental school and I was drilling and filling ones and that I, I feel bad. I did more harm than good and removed more sound enamel when I could have just watched that, maybe done topical fluorides or even just placed a, a splint. Uh, <clears throat> But again, forever student, I can change, I can grow. So this is the International Caries Consensus Collaboration, which represented 21 global experts in cariology uh, that got together to address a gap between research findings and clinical practice. Uh, the reasons for this are complex, but contributing factors are inconsistencies in clinical guidelines, dental education, national health care policies, and remuneration systems. And some of the, the big names in this group were uh, Dr. Yo Franken. I'll speak about him a little bit more lately. Ooh, I just noticed a typo there. <laughs> There's another N in his name. Uh, Dr. Nicola Ines, uh, Dr. Margarita Fontana, who I've mentioned uh, with University of Michigan. Uh, and I love this paper <laughs> in particular, but don't know, can't do, won't change. Barriers to moving knowledge to action in managing the curious lesion. The failure to follow new evidence is not limited to dentists who are out of touch, do not take continuing professional development, or have been practicing for many years. In some countries and some schools, new dentists are still taught to remove all infected carious tissue, and it is actually not possible to pass professional examinations without demonstrating this. The reasons underlying this failure to translate evidence into clinical practice are many and complex. The don't know could be due to general ignorance, perhaps remedied with an appropriate educational intervention, or the more problematic, willful ignorance. I love that term, willful ignorance, where the subject chooses not to learn more about a topic, perhaps because it challenges his or her current beliefs. You know, who knew caries could be as polarizing as politics? <laughs> I would have never known that until I got kind of thrown into the speaking world. <laughs> uh, but it, it's crazy. Uh, so the International Caries Consensus Collaboration compiled these consensus papers, which are really fantastic. So if you can access these in your in your time of, of quarantine and social distancing, I highly recommend to, to review them. Um, so they have a consensus paper on carious tissue removal, 
uh, most of us dentists uh, and, and oral health care providers are very type A. You know, we like to, to follow the rules. So this is great because they have these decision trees on, on managing carious lesions. Um, so for example, let's say you have a permanent tooth um, with a deep lesion where uh, you might risk pulp exposure. You could do selective removal of carious tissue to so and leave soft carries behind, or you could do stepwise removal and, and art. Um, so you can follow that. They also have consensus recommendations on terminology, okay? Because there's a lot of confusion about, you know, what is soft or what's mushy or, so trying to have us all speaking the same language, <laughs> so to speak. But I, I thought this was particularly helpful especially in, in people's understanding or, or follow-up assessment of a SDF treated carious lesion is understanding these different layers of a carious lesion. So uh, at the top of this lesion, you can see that soft dent in there, okay? The necrotic zone, the contaminated zone, that's soft mushy caries. So, you know, you could treat that with SDF, you, it, but it doesn't matter how much you douse that with, it, it's never going to remineralize. It's necrotic. It's dead tissue. So if you could remove that, whether it's with your handpiece or even just using a spoon excavator, it is beneficial to remove that so that you have a better uh, bond to, to sound tooth structure. Um, but the, the point of this is you don't have to drill, drill, drill all that away and then potentially expose the pulp and or create inflammation and an uh, uh, inflammatory response because you've irritated uh, the pulp. <clears throat> so contemporary concepts in carious tissue removal, um, the modern concepts for managing caries and its symptoms, i.e. the carious lesions, aim to avoid invasive treatments whenever possible and instead attempt to control the activity of the biofilm uh, and the lesions. So this ecological plaque hypothesis, so just remembering that caries is an imbalance in the biofilm, okay? So the acidogenic and acidogenic bacteria are, are dominating, okay? Um, under frequent intake of carbs, <laughs> i.e. the quarantine 15, <laughs> right? Everyone's home uh, stress eating. Um, so those eventually dominate the, the biofilm, resulting in a further imbalance between mineral gain from saliva and mineral loss by demineralization, leading to the symptom of the disease, i.e. the, the carious lesion. <clears throat> so if, if these concepts are foreign to you, if it's not what you were taught in dental school, it most certainly was not what I was taught in dentist, dental school. I mean, I would fail the exam if, if I left caries. Um, so just, just remember that we used to think the earth was flat. So it, it's okay to review the evidence and, and, and it's okay to change. <laughs> It'll be okay. Um, so new biomimetic dental materials, uh, i.e. modern glass ionomer restoratives have many benefits, uh, but just to highlight some of the benefits, the biocompatibility, meaning it's, it's uh, it mimics our natural tooth structure. Um, it's easier to, to use because it's hydrophilic. Um, it does have an antimicrobial effect, which is, which is great. And it does release and recharge with, with fluoride. So it's truly bioactive. So glass ionomers have been bio, bioactive before that became like a marketing <laughs> buzzword. <laughs> like they're legitimately bioactive. And they do have this superior marginal seal where there's actually an, an ion exchange between the ma material and the tooth structure via chemical bonding. Um, so that is unique to, to this type of material. Um, when you're using a, a glass ionomer restorative, you do want to use what's called the cavity conditioner, i.e. PAA or polyacrylic acid. And it's important to understand if, if these restorative materials are new to you as they were new to me because we didn't get a chance to use these at all uh, when I was going through my formal training. Um, in fact, all I, I had ever used were RMGIs like Beecher Bond, which I just used as a liner, and then uh, cement. So there was a point in time where conceptually, I didn't understand that you could use glass as a restorative material. Uh, and I still encounter 
when I lecture, I will encounter other dentists who, who are at that same point and not conceptually understanding that this could be a filling or, or a definitive <laughs> material, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> so it's important to understand that polyacrylic acid is a weaker acid. It's a 20%. It's not the same and it's not interchangeable with your conventional resin etch, i.e. a 37% phosphoric acid etch. And they're not, you, that you can't interchange them. So a 37% phosphoric acid etch is just going to obliterate <laughs> that smear layer and, and wipe out the minerals that you're trying to free, free up for your chemical bond, whereas uh, the conditioner is actually going to improve chelation and improve the, the chemical bond. Uh, it's also important to point out that you don't use a bonding agent for glass restoratives. Okay, that would actually get in the way. You don't want, you're not just gluing something to a surface, <laughs> right? Okay, so you don't, you don't want a bonding agent. You don't need, it's not uh, that type of, of, of bond. So Dr. Hien No is a glass animer guru, you could say, um, and this slide comes from him, and this is called the Rocky Mountain slide, <laughs> but just showing this chemically fused layer between the enamel and uh, the glass ionomer where there's this uh, ionic exchange of calcium from the enamel and then coming from the restorative material you have ions like strontium and and fluoride and you have this chemical fused layer that that it doesn't leak at at the margin so I thought this was a great way to visualize it this is from Dr. Rella Christensen who of course is the wife of Dr. Gordon Christensen, where they were looking at restorative materials. And at the top, you can see two of the, what are considered some of the higher quality glass uh, restoratives. So like a Equia Forte, which is from GC or uh, 3M's Keytac Universal. And you can see that there's no leaking at the margin between the enamel and the restorative material. Whereas if you look at a resin or like these products that claim to be bioactive, uh, you can see the leaking at the margin because essentially the moment you light cure a resin, there is going to be leaking at the margin. And as resin fails over time, and I'm sure you've observed this, it, and it, it doesn't matter how, it's not just because someone is so good at gluing something <laughs> or their rubber dam is just so awesome. No, just as the chronic disease process of caries, as the acids act at that that um, surface, you're going to have separation, and 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 you'll notice when your resins fail, there's usually mushy caries at at the margin, right? Um, but you don't see mushy caries around or under a pure glass uh, restorative. <clears throat> and that they also looked at uh, fluoride released from different restorative materials, and you'll notice that the Equia Forte product, which is new and improved Fuji Nine. Uh, released the most fluoride. Of course, it's it's you have this burst of fluoride initially, which then uh, tapers off. But I just thought it was interesting that some products that market themselves as being bioactive released very little uh, fluoride. It's similar to ones without uh, bioactive claims. So I thought that was interesting. Um, so modern day high viscosity glass animal restoratives and glass hybrid restoratives are not your granddad's glass ionomer. <laughs> but unfortunately, there's still those lingering misconceptions. Um, I definitely have heard these, <laughs> but you know, like in my day, glass ionomer cement would wash out. So that is, that is a common lingering misconception and it, is, it just doesn't hold true to, to modern day uh, glass restoratives. Uh, so in, in Europe where amalgam for the most part has been banned, these are the, the replacement <laughs> materials. It's not an interim material. Sure, you could use it as an interim material, but it could also be a definitive restorative material. They are are bulk fill because these, this, uh, for example, the Equia Forte is, is a pure glass. It's self self curing. Now, if you add the resin coat, sure, that that needs to be light cured. Uh, but just to try to help dispel those misconceptions, here's an example of a class two that I did on a permanent molar. And I don't know if you can appreciate in the bottom right, or actually top right too, that this tooth also had some degree of uh, molar incisor hypomineralization or MIH. Uh, but yeah, this is a, a durable <clears throat> material. And 
two of my colleagues that I, I have learned quite a bit from and, and, and helped me to get over my learning curve for using glass restoratives are uh, Dr. Doug Young, who, uh, who was with the University of Pacific, and then uh, Dr. Pamela Margliano Munez. Um, I believe she still teaches at, at Tufts um, and lectures quite extensively. So I, I would recommend to look at these. So Dr. Young posted, the, or excuse me, <laughs> not posted, wrote this in, in, and shared this incredible uh, case study in the 2018 ADA journal of, I would call that an epic smart case. This is a, a young woman with Shorten syndrome. Uh, and then I thought this particular case from Dr. Pamela was was pretty cool. So that she did essentially an equia crown on Dr. Ryan Ovi. Of course, people know that name as well. Uh, so I thought that was a great way to, to help dispel these misconceptions of, of this material uh, and that it is in fact quite, quite strong. Um, my daughter uh, recently chipped her permanent uh, incisor and I restored it with Equia Forte HT, which is high translucency. So yeah, no, this is, this is a durable material. Okay, so World Health Organization, of course, we're hearing that quite a bit uh, through this pandemic, uh, but with respects to the history of atraumatic restorative treatment, um, it was introduced on World Health Day in uh, 1994 as part of the year of oral health. And the project manager of the WHO Art Initiative was Dr. Jo Franken from the Netherlands. And uh, this is his new textbook, which is outstanding. Um, and this is where you can purchase it, Stephen Hancock's publishing. I uh, highly recommend if you're like me and art and glass restoratives were missing from your formal de dental education, uh, this was incredibly helpful uh, to me. So I, I would uh, recommend getting this book. Uh, but I really like the way that he describes atraumatic restorative treatment, where it, it combines modern cariology and a biomimetic dental material, i.e. glass atomer restoratives, in patient-centered care, giving it a place in the modern dental practice and in outreach situations. In other words, art is not just for, you know, uh, your mission trip. <laughs> art is for me in my private practice and a, a well-behaved kid. It, it could be for, for anyone. And there is co controversy over terminology, uh, specifically interim versus a traumatic. So interim, of course, implies temporary. So we have to re remember and recognize all restorations have a finite longevity. I don't ha care how great you are gluing something <laughs> in time. <laughs> all restorations fail, you know, whether that's six years or whether it's 20, 20 years, but you know, they're not uh, indestructible indefinitely. Um, now, atraumatic, placing a restoration in an atraumatic way does not equate temporary, okay? Now, if you look at the pyramid for the quality of, of evidence, um, you know, the top of the pyramid would be the meta-analysis of randomized control trials. So that's the highest level of evidence. Just beneath that would be a single randomized control trial, okay? Way down toward the bottom would be expert opinion. <laughs> okay, so let's look at some of these meta-analyses with respects to art difference in survival results between single surface art restorations and amalgam restorations in permanent teeth over the first three years. Okay, and here's another one. This, in again, permanent teeth after 6.3 years. Wow, uh, we conclude that the restorations produced with the art approach with high viscosity glass ionomer survived longer than those produced with the traditional approach with amalgam in the permanent teeth of young children. We recommend the art approach as a complement to the preventive activities um, in the Syrian school oral health programs. So uh, in the textbook that I showed you, I, I really like this distinction that Dr. Franken made with regard to art versus the term ITR or interim therapeutic restoration. Um, so to name as interim a dental procedure art 
that has evidence that its survival percentages is not significantly different from amalgam and resin composite in single surface cavities is to say that amalgam and resin composite restorations should not be considered permanent procedures. Oh my. <laughs> That was quite the zinger. Um, so considerations for restoring the form, function, and aesthetics of SDF-treated teeth in children um, would be to, first of all, recognize that not every SDF-treated tooth is gonna even need a restoration, right? So let's say you're treating an incipient lesion or you're treating hypersensitivity. The SDF might be all you need, right? Or let, let's say like those incisors that are the most likely to arrest because they're open and easily clean. Um, SDF might be all you need to do, okay, until those teeth exfoliate naturally. <clears throat> Excuse me. Who uh, coughs now and freaks out? <laughs> me. <clears throat> I think my, my, I'm just getting dry. Oh, it's a dry cough. <clears throat> so, you want to use your best clinical judgment. I really like the, the decision tree or flow chart that Dr. Horst had in his two lectures. Those were, that was really great. Um, I'll need to get that and uh, add that into my lecture. So shout out to Dr. Horst. But um, using your clinical judgment, um, now with respects to children, looking at their calendar age and the dental age of the, the patient, um, looking at the cleansability of the lesion, you know, is it open? Can you easily clean out the food or plaque? Um, and then the associated risk factors, like is that tooth likely to fracture if you don't put a restoration? Is that lesion likely to keep on growing because it's not an open lesion? Um, but then also keeping in mind, would that what's the child's behavior like? Would, they, would you still need to sedate them to accomplish the restoration? Um, that's what you want to consider. And then of course, the, con, uh, the aspect of the patient and, and parental preference. So like, for example, the incisors, if aesthetically it's not a concern, maybe that's all you need to do. And I want to make it very clear that it, right now I am most certainly not advocating that we just be running out and doing art and smart on everyone or SDF on everyone. No. At this time, we should only be treating true dental emergencies and following ADA interim guidance on screening and treating emergencies during this pandemic. Okay, so I want to make sure that's that's abundantly clear. You know, one of the advantages of, of SDF and ART is that you don't have to use uh, hand pieces. So there's no aerosol produced. However, that doesn't mean you can just do business as usual doing non-aerosol procedures. That's not what I'm saying. So in this time, we should still be solely treating emergencies and following ADA guidelines. However, now if you are managing emergency, that might include SDF or, or ART, um, but you should only be treating emergencies right now. So SMART is an acronym for Silver Modified Atraumatic Restorative Treatment. So it's silver diamine fluoride to arrest and remineralize a carious lesion, and then a glass ion or cement restorative to restore and further remineralize because of course it, it releases fluoride and other ions. Um, now, SMART itself, there is not a lot of, of, of existing literature specific to this. I'll show you some papers, but essentially what's happening here is we're taking two treatments, which independent of one another have high levels of evidence. So we have high level of evidence for SDF. We have high level of evidence for ART. There is nothing, nothing to say that you cannot build upon <laughs> one another, okay? Um, so for example, this tooth where I did zero excavation, you know, this tooth was treated with SDF at the exam. And then I brought them back. Uh, I wait at least two weeks because I don't want there to be any lingering free silver ions. So my restorative material will stay white if I'm able to place a restoration um, as I was in this case. And that was hard as a rock. I did zero excavation, placed my uh, glass hybrid, which was the Equia Forte. And this is it two years later. It's now been three years. I need to get a new image. Um, but you would have no idea that had I had done this any other way. I mean, it looks like I gave the kid a shot, put a rubber dam and drilled the tooth and put resin, right? <laughs> so it is an aesthetic and durable restoration, okay? Uh, so people do question, you know, what's the point of SMART? Right? Why not just do art? And that is a valid question. And in many cases, if a patient can tolerate a restoration, 
I'll just do a conventional restoration, right? Or let's say they will tolerate art, I'll just do art. But in, in, in many cases, especially with children, if, it, if they're new to you and they're fearful and there's this fear of the unknown, perhaps SDF is all that they could tolerate at the moment, okay? That's one component. Then there's another component. Often patients are coming to us with massive disease, right? Where they have four quads of carious lesions and it is not possible to do art conventional art on every single tooth. Let's say the kid is four or five, they're, they're, they're apprehensive. You know, I like to think of SDF as a first line of treatment because you're essentially putting out the fire, right? You're controlling the curious lesions, you're controlling the biofilm and stabilizing things so that things don't get worse um, while you're proceeding to do the restorations, okay? So I really like the way Dr. John Fichella uh, phrased it is he said to be a firefighter first okay so that would be the sdf aspect where you can control the biofilm and arrest and remineralize lesions and then be a carpenter second okay you can restore the teeth as time money and and behavior allow okay and i do like Smokey the bear because he says remember only you can prevent forest fires are you listening parents? <laughs> Are you listening patients? This is your disease and only you can control and prevent it, right? With your diet and your hygiene. There you go. They gotta own their disease. Um, so smart restorations could be sealants, fillings, and even crowns. I, I, I consider hall technique a version of smart. Tooth preparation for smart will vary on a case-by-case -case scenario, depending on the patient, the lesion, and the clinical situation. And it may involve removal of tooth structure ranging from all of the caries, some of the caries, or none. And I realize none will still freak some people out, but remember, just breathe. Science is ever evolving. We're forever students. Go back to the guidelines from FDA, excuse me, FDI. Go to the guidelines from ADA. Uh, read the consensus papers from the International Caries uh, Consensus Collaboration. It, it is okay to leave caries. Now, the chemical bond of, of SMART, uh, th there is confusion over how SDF impacts uh, bond to resin and glass, and it does not adversely affect either. I hope I have that slide in here, but I referenced some of the, the studies specifically on that. Uh, so chemical bonds remind, rely upon a chemical reaction between the two components and form a strong junction. Um, chemical bonds are not prone to detachment, i.e. no leaking at the margin. So this is a, a lovely image of a smart treated tooth where you can see this sclerotic glass-like enamel and dentin um, arrested remineralized carries this, this hybrid layer between the tooth and then the, the glass. Ah, I did have that slide. So you, you can absolutely bond to SDF treated surfaces um, <clears throat> and whether it's resin or glass, there, there's no, no difference. Um, in fact, a, a more recent study showed there was actually improvement in the retention uh, properties of a fissure sealant applied after the uh, treatment with SDF and that was using a resin. <laughs> oh my goodness, what? Uh, now I mentioned this a uh, book before from Dr. Graham Craig, highly recommend getting this book and um, mention how he was the first to introduce the concept of silver fluoride and glass restoratives in the late 1970s in Australia. And I do like to think of his study, the Burke study, which was from 78 to 84, as the first SMART study, you know, before we called SMART smart. I don't know who, when, or how that was, was coined, um, nor does it, in my opinion, really matter. <laughs> but, it, you know, I do think of this as the first uh, piece of evidence for the efficacy of this approach, um, particularly for managing apprehensive patients. Uh, and I thought what was, was particularly beneficial of this book was I had already started, when I got this, I had already started using SDF 
but I started very small and cautiously kind of cherry picking cases that I was trying to avoid GA or said, and seeing the cases that he presented and followed long term, you know, four or five years, it, it gave me the confidence to take that next step to start managing the larger lesions. And I'll, and I'll show you some of my bigger, bigger cases. Of course, I showed you a very small, simple occlusal, um, but I'll show you some of the bigger cases as well. Um, I also highly recommend this resource. This is the newest of the books. This is Smart Oral Health compiled by uh, Dr. Steve Duffin, who is a dentist in Oregon. And uh, shout out to Dr. Duffin. <laughs> in the original broadcast of this, he graciously donated one of these, these uh, books, but it is available on Amazon and there's and there's, I don't know how many contributors there were. I want to say there were dozens of contributors. I was able to add a chapter in here, but uh, just a really great resource on SMART, uh, as well as the evidence for silver fluoride and for, for glass ionomer restoratives. And Dr. Duffin is going all over the world, helping to manage and control caries with the SMART approach, uh, where he's going and, and treating basically the whole school <laughs> with, with silver diamine fluoride, and then they come back several months later and, and, and in cavitated lesions place glass and do the, the smart restorations. But it's pretty amazing what, what he is, is doing. So uh, here's some more papers specific to silver fluoride or silver diamine fluoride followed by glass ionomer cement. Of course, in the US, we have silver diamine fluoride. There is silver fluoride in, in Australia, so ammonia-free. In this particular study, it showed that SDF doesn't adversely affect bond strength of the restoration to dentin, but it, it did help increase resistance of secondary caries at, at the margins of the glass, so the, and composite, excuse me. All right, so as far as, as SMART, if you place SDF and a glass restorative, even a self-curing glass restorative on the same day, it's important to know that the material will eventually turn gray, kind of like a pale amalgam, so the example on the left. Let's say you're doing it a different day and just doing partial caries removal, like say ART, it's important for the patient and or parent, and in the case of treating young child patients, to know that you will still see some dark at the margins and that that's okay. Okay, I like to think of it like a scar. <laughs> um, although in some cases, like the example on the right, even with zero excavation, sometimes, especially if you're using a very opaque glass restorative, like this was Equia Forte, sometimes you can completely mask the black scar of, of the SDF arrested caries even without excavation, okay? So let's review just a basic aesthetic smart. This is what I typically do because I am in private practice. Often we're seeing these patients from the time they're toddlers until they're going off to, to college. So that that is my situation, but I recognize that that's not gonna be everyone's scenario. Some folks might be in an FQHC right? And this is your one and only opportunity to, to see this patient, perhaps. And perhaps you might want to do same day SMART. But my personal typical approach is to do a two stage where I'm putting SDF at the exam to put out the fire and then bring them back to reassess the lesions. I wait at least two to four weeks for cavitated lesions. And uh, if behavior is uh, better, <laughs> or if they're willing and able to accept a restoration because their initial uh, encounter with a, a dental procedure was something quick and painless and simple, like applying SDF is, a lot of times these kids are now trusting me and they'll allow me to place the glass restorative. Great. And then I'll just do it. I won't reapply the SDF. But let's say they come back and they're still all over the place, hot mess. I'll reapply SDF and then I'll see them at, at a six month mark. Now, had they just had incipient lesion, let, let's say non-cavitated incipient lesions, I would have just waited six months. Um, so anyhow, basic aesthetic smart, the SDF was applied at the exam. I have them back uh, two weeks later and reassess and reevaluate the lesion. Ideally, it's matte black and has sound margins. If it doesn't, you can, because this is such a good desensitizer, SDF is such a good desensitizer, you could 
do caries removal without the need for local anesthetic. Now in this COVID-19 world and with a goal of trying to reduce aerosol, stick to hand instruments. You could use a spoon excavator. I think I have on the next slide. Yes, so Dr. Franken has an excellent chapter in his book looking specifically at hand instruments and which ones he recommends and how to use them. You know, we happen to already have spoon excavators, so that's typically what I, I use. And you could remove soft carries. Again, not you don't want to expose the pulp, but you could remove soft carries. Now, let's say we weren't worried about aerosols. You could even pick up your high speed or slow speed without local and, and, and clean and get clean cable surface margins. And then this is my uh, armamentarium here. I'm using the Equia Forte system. So I'm going to clean the carious lesion with the polyacrylic acid, the cavity conditioner on a micro brush. So normally in a non-COVID-19, I'm not worried as much about aerosol world. I, I would have gone in with a slow speed profi tufted brush and used plain pumice to clean that out. But um, if we're trying to focus on reducing aerosols, you could just use the micro brush coated with the conditioner and clean uh, the cavitated lesion. And you do that for 10 seconds. And then you wanna rinse it, but you don't wanna dry, over dry or desiccate it. Remember that glass needs moisture to set. So if you're trying to eliminate or reduce aerosol, you could rinse it with just sopping wet gauze and you could dry it with just dry gauze versus using an air water syringe. And then you wanna isolate. You don't need a rubber dam. You could just use cotton isolation, which is more tolerated by the kids. And then you're gonna activate and triturate your uh, glass material, this being the Equia system. And then I like to set a timer for two and a half minutes because that's how long it, it takes to set. But I do strongly recommend waiting longer for other techniques. Like if you're doing a class two, or let's say you're doing a strip crown, I would wait at least three and a half minutes before attempting to slide a matrix band out to the side. Um, I would wait even longer than that <laughs> to peel off a strip crown form. Um, <clears throat> and I apply the, cap, uh, the material to the cavitation. I like to use the applicator gun directly. Some say you could like press it in with your finger. Me personally, I prefer the, the precision and the control of using the applicator gun. And, and I can introduce the, it to the child in a non-intimidating way. We talk about it like it, it's frosting. We talk about the the triturator, the the capsule mixer, like a blender, you know, like we're making a frappuccino. Um, so those are some of the ways you can make it non-intimidating. The sights and sounds of what we're doing. Um, so it's important to remember that the working time is short for a pure glass restorative like this. Um, so you want to get it into place as quickly as possible, and it can vary depending on heat and humidity. So the package specifies that it's a one minute, 15 second working time. Now, remember I'm in Arizona, which is dry and hot. I try to get it in place quicker than that, like 45 seconds to get it in place. Um, and there, there is a learning curve to, to using these materials if you're used to, to working with resin. So just, just uh, know that and, and it's okay. Uh, so if, let's say you're first starting out, one way you might want to help adapt it would be to use a damp Q-tip, not sopping wet, but damp, uh, just so it's not sticking back. Or uh, as you get quicker and faster with these, you could use your instruments. Like I use a ball burnisher, a haul and back. You could even dip or coat it in the, the coat and, and adapt it. Uh, but just the, the key here is to, to work very, very quickly. Uh, I know in Dr. Horse, lecture he reviews his tips for that as well so you know just remember different everyone will have a different way of, of doing it and and we can glean little pearls here and there from 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 everyone in it and that should be hopefully helpful but just remember that over manipulating the material beyond the working time like when it starts to get doughy you could disrupt the glass matrix and the material is is not gonna last as long as it could have or let's say it starts to dry out like I, I, <laughs> I think this, the analogy first came from Dr. Brian Novi, and I thought that was just made, it really clicked in my head like, oh yeah, like if it starts to look like Parmesan cheese, it's gonna fail, it's, it's drying out, quit, quit messing with it. Um, so you, uh, I apply the Fuji coat 
over the glass and then light cure that for 20 seconds. So that is, is providing a barrier to saliva while the glass is achieving its ideal physical properties. And here's the finished product. This is immediately after. We then instruct the patient to avoid chewing hard foods for 48 hours. So another nice analogy would be like placing an amalgam. Like you know amalgam gets super strong, right? Super durable. But initially it's soft, right? It, ha it has to go through this chemical reaction. So, so same concept. We give them this handout, well, to the parent. And you can download this off our website, which is, again, it's kidsteethembraces.com. I do believe this particular form is at the bottom of our SDF page under uh, resources for dentists. So here's that tooth uh, before, immediately after, six months later, 12 months later, 18 months later, 24 months later. I think it's been at least two and a half years. This is my uh, daughter's friend, so. So let's, that, wouldn't it be simple if, if the whole world was just tiny little occlusal cavities? Wouldn't that be great? Is that the reality? No, <laughs> it's not. Uh, so let's look at some bigger cases. So here's a five-year-old. This was her first ever dental visit, totally asymptomatic. Mom was a physician's assistant, believe it or not. Uh, and it wasn't until the mom was brushing her teeth and looked in the mouth and saw the hole. So I, I hope you can appreciate on the on the on number K or letter K that huge occlusal cavity, totally asymptomatic. And when I looked in the child's mouth, the teeth were well intact. So this is like I call it like the wormhole in an apple, where it's all mush underneath, but asymptomatic, and tons of sound enamel left when you look when I look clinically. So I, I did SDF and the smart on this this patient. So here she is, 14 months later. You can see, because I did zero excavation, you can see the gray of the uh, SDF treated caries that was left, and then the sealed Equia Forte uh, restorations. <clears throat> uh, but I mean, those those are pretty deep, but you know, nothing blew up. That's, that's like a common phrase I'll hear people say like, oh, it's gonna blow up. No, it didn't. And then if you look at it over time, you know, honestly, it was probably the angulation of that PA that made it look like that was a pulp exposure, but but it wasn't. And when we were able to get bite wings, you can see there was a layer of dentin between the carious lesion and the pulp. Okay, and you can also see that over time, the caries that was left behind, the affected dentin that was not removed, it's still going to look radiolucent. So what you wanna be looking for here is ensuring that you have sealed intact margins, okay? You would have to have an open margin for bacteria to get in and for the lesion to grow. You will also no notice uh, in dentin, you, you can see reparative or tertiary dentin formation. Now, if, you, if you're talking about lesions confined to enamel, like if you look on her right side and you can see those clear dark triangles between say S and T, but then when you look in 2019, you don't, don't really see those dark, triangles anymore, they're, or, or at least they're shrinking. Um, you know, if it's confined to enamel, I, I, I will, and I have observed remineralization and more radio opacity, but if it's in the dent and, it, it's, and you leave affected caries, it's still going to, to look dark. Uh, this was two years later. <clears throat> to your clinical pictures. Of course, now her permanent first molars are coming in. Those got sealed with glass as well. But yeah, you know, back in the day, this would have been automatic pulp and crown sedation. But uh, here's another case, another five-year-old. She was actually a second opinion for IV sedation. Again, asymptomatic with these deep occlusal, occlusal lesions. I assume you can Appreciate that. Of course, the, these are, I'm just taking pictures of someone else's x-rays because that it was a second opinion. I did SDF and SMART, zero excavation. So that is why you see a bit of dark, but the margins are sealed, the lesions are rest. Nothing blew up. <laughs> um, this is on the panel. You can see the dent in between the carious 
the carries that were left behind and then the uh, pulp. Uh, this is nearly two years later. But again, nice healthy gingiva. The teeth are intact. They're not breaking apart. The equia forte is holding up nicely and the margins are nice and sealed. Um, yeah, so the, the parents were extremely appreciative of this op option. And uh, I mean, they literally laughed at the price difference between our minimally invasive treatment plan and the prior IV sedation treatment plan. So they, they, they were very appreciative. And these are the folks that become the strongest advocates of our practice and why we see so many word of mouth referrals. Um, so here's the more recent pictures. Yeah. Now, here's an example of, of a same day SMART followed for over two years. So of course, these are a lot darker because it, the materials replace the same day. Okay. Now, you know, a, a SMART filling is not always going to be viable. Sure. And these teeth were circumferentially, they're sound, solid enamel. Sure, you could do that. But if, if you're talking proximal lesions, really cavitated, broken down crowns of teeth, you can't just do SMART. It's not going to withstand the forces of occlusion long term. So yes, you could do some SDF and glass to buy some time, but something like this, it, it really warrants full coverage. It really warrants a crown. Um, so that's where Hall technique comes in. And we just don't have enough time to cover that in this particular lecture, but this is where I would direct you to the Hall technique on the University of Dundee. This technique, of, of course, coming from a GP in Scotland, uh, Dr. Norna Hall. There are high levels of evidence for Hall technique. There are four randomized control trials. Okay. And then this is a paper from the ADA journal looking at conventional versus Hall technique results and their equivalent. Oh my. <laughs> uh, and there's this resource you can watch as well. This is uh, demonstrating a Hall cr crown done in a patient after they had been treated with SDF. The mom initially was opposed to restorative period, but I, I, as I built trust with her and the child, I, I explained, listen, this is gonna continue to trap food. This is gonna continue to chip open. It needs a crown. And, and finally, I, I won her over and she consented to do the crowns. But so in this case, uh, SDF acted as a time buyer, but just please remember that it's not necessary to use SDF prior to placing a Hall crown. None of the clinical trials for Hall crowns had SDF in, in the protocol. So we know we don't need it for the efficacy of this procedure. However, it can be a stopgap, you know, if you're trying to build trust um, and, and, and uh, with the child and or the parent and uh, if to help with your behavior management. Um, or some people call it like a belt and suspenders, you know, giving you that added security that you you have carries control under your crown. Uh, so here's an example of a, a barely two-year-old with with all four first primary molars were carious and hypoplastic. Mom did not want IV set or GA, which the older sibling had had. Uh, so these were treated with SDF and then four Hall crowns. This is her five months later. I mean, you wouldn't know that I had done it any other way. Nine and a half months later, 17 months, two years, you know, it's a, it's a effective treatment. This is an article you could read in the most recent Dental Town magazine. Uh, so my, my feeling is this, why choose to overcomplicate something when the evidence has shown us it's not necessary? Why? What's the point? <laughs> um, and you can combine the, the various options to deliver patient-centered care. So here's an example of a typical child that I would see in my practice. This is one of my patients uh, where they have four quads of caries, including anterior caries. So SDF alone for the anteriors, those were the most likely to arrest. Aesthetics was a concern. No problem, did SDF there, uh, did SMART. Like I, hopefully you can see there's an occlusal on, on L. So that was SMART. And then if you look at the upper first primary molars, those are broken down. Those really need full coverage. So those were Hall crowns. So here's that same patient. So you can say SDF only for the anterior, occlusal for the lower molar, and then um, Hall crowns for the upper. 
first permanent molars. So, you know, you have a, a happy kid, happy parrot, and a happy dentist. <laughs> and here's another example of, of a, a, a beautiful little baby with severe early childhood caries when she was just 19 months old. The parents did not want her to be IV or GA sedated. They did not care what that the SDF would turn the caries black. So you could see how we managed her over time just with SDF alone initially. And you can see how the lesions uh, became shiny and hard and arrested and the teeth continued to erupt a little further. And then when she was older and now able to sit still in the chair and be comfortable and confident and, and, and trust me, I did the direct minimally invasive restorations. And this is a beautiful, happy, healthy child. So what, you know, why not? This is just another option. It's not going to do away with everything that we do. It's just another option that we can, can offer. It's not going to be for every child. It's not going to be for every parent. It's not going to be for every family or, or tooth, but it, it, it's, an, it's an option. And when it's a clinically viable op option, I feel we're morally and ethically obligated to offer it, especially if the alternative would be uh, deep sedation or general anesthesia. We, we, we need to be offering this to the patients. Uh, I show her case in this article. This is a CE article where you can get additional, I think it's two CE credits. Uh, this was sponsored by Elevate Oral Care. This is in Dimensions of Dental Hygiene. So this is another CE opportunity that you could use during your time of, of quarantine and sheltering in place. So my personal stance is take nothing out of your toolbox. You know, prior to March, prior to March 17th, <laughs> and when I closed my office, you know, I was still doing everything, still doing a little bit of everything. But uh, I have dramatically reduced the amount of sedation that I'm doing in my private practice by about 67% since prior to us obtaining SDF and prior to, to widely adopting minimal interventions. So I, I feel as a pediatric dentist that that is, that is a great thing because when I reduce the sedation, it's reducing risk and cost. It's also increasing access to care because I can see a higher volume of patients. You know, when we used to do IV sedation, which I don't anymore in my office, we would block out the whole day for like three, four kids. And inevitably someone would get sick or no show or same day cancel or find Cheetos in the back seat and violate their MPO. And I, often it was a huge money loser <laughs> to have our, our IV sedation days fall apart. But more, more than that, you know, that when I'm just seeing four, three or four kids in, an, in a day versus when I, when I can eliminate sedation and have my whole office open and all nine chairs running, I can, I can, be available to treat more kids at a lower cost. So offering minimal interventions can, I feel, does a lot for your for your practice. It's it's offering patient-centered care. I find that we have increased patient retention because you're essentially offering something for every for everyone. You know, if they if that family prefers sedation and cosmetic dentistry, we do that. If that patient prefers minimally invasive options, we do that too. So it's, it's something for everyone. It doesn't mean you have to take away anything else that you're doing. Uh, you're just adding in more options. Uh, we, we see a lot more internal marketing because the parents are talking to other parents. I'm seeing improved outcomes, reducing stress for, for myself and for the, the patients and, and the parents especially. Uh, I mentioned how it's increased this act increasing access to care because you're able to see a higher volume of patients, uh, reducing overhead expenses, reducing recurrent caries because we're using antimicrobial restoratives and, and treatments. I should add topical treatments like SDF. And it, it is reducing the individual cost per patient, which is great for the private payers. And it's great for our, our taxpayers that are funding the Medicaid dollars going to, to dentistry, right? Um, however, when I see a higher volume of patients, I'm still very productive. Um, and, you know, it, it is reducing aerosols, um, which, is, which is a new concern with this novel uh, coronavirus. So why is this a smart option? It, it 
increases access to care, reduces cost, and improves health. So the, the concept of the triple aim of, of healthcare. And we do need to get the incentives right. Uh, this is a great article by Dr. Niederman where he showed or explained that the one of the problems is dental insurance payment systems, they're not aligned with current best evidence, which just exacer exacerbates inequities. You know, we, we almost incentivize the more invasive treatments because they're paid the highest or reimbursed the highest, right? Whereas the things that matter the most, the things that impact the disease the most, you know, the oral hygiene instruction, the prevention, that's often or typically reimbursed the least and sometimes not reimbursed at all. That's a problem. <laughs> it's at least now teledentistry it, it, in my state, they're reimbursing teledentistry. So that's great. Like in Dr. Allen's excellent motivational interviewing webinar, talking about what we can do besides just picking up our hand pieces, what we can do to help patients to control their disease with, with diet uh, and, and hygiene education. <clears throat> so it'll be interesting to see how our, our profession ad adapts and changes over, over time. You know, are we going to be looking to procedure-based measures or, or outcomes-based measures? Are we, are we going to be, is, are, is our success going to be valued by doing things for patients or rather than doing things to patients, like procedures to patients? Um, and I understand that there's controversy around treatments like, such as hall crowns or smart fillings and, and you know, like that somehow that we should charge less or something. Um, but, you know, think of it this way. If you need to sedate a patient to accomplish a treatment, should you reduce your fee, right? Because really the, the sedation costs more, you know, if you're cutting dry and frying the pulp and you have to do a prophylactic pulpotomy, that's increasing cost too. So, I mean, you really could look at two sides to, to the coin. There is no such thing as a separate smart code or a hall crown code. My advice is just to bill what you do. You know, what is the treatment that you're accomplishing? What is the efficacy of the, the procedure you're you're accomplishing? You know, just because you're restoring a tooth with a glass item or cement restoration, uh, in an atraumatic fashion doesn't mean it's interim. Um, I warranty it just as I would any other conventionally placed restoration. And you, you showed the evidence to show it was e equivalent. Um, so now let's say you are doing something like this is a MIH molar treated with SDF and SMART. This was billed out as a protective restoration. That's the interim code for a permanent molar because obviously that is not the end-all be-all restoration for this particular tooth. That is either going to need a crown at some point or even extraction and second molar substitution, right? But in the meantime, this child, their sensitivity is under control. Uh, the caries are under control. So that to me is an interim solution. Now, if you think of like those simple occlusal two-stage smart that I showed you, that to me is a definitive treatment I don't really like the term definitive because all restorations have a finite longevity and caries is a chronic disease process. So if this kid continues to eat Takis and drink Gatorade, they could get proximal caries, right? It's not like me filling the hole is gonna stop him from getting other holes, <laughs> right? But long story short, this was billed as an occlusal composite. And, and the evidence show it's equivalent to having had done a conventional uh, resin or, or amalgam. And, you know, you can see this two years later, it's been really been three years. Um, and same with the uh, hall crown that I'm billing the stainless steel code. You know, these crowns, for example, have been there two years. They're uh, durable, the, the gingiva is healthy. Uh, this, this is a stainless steel crown. <laughs> uh, so as far as uh, other resources, I mentioned my website, kidsteethembraces.com. I do have a YouTube channel, which is Affiliated Children's Dental Specialist. There's tons of videos on there on smart technique, whole technique, um, applying SDF. Um, and I have uh, a number of on-demand webinars with uh, Dental Town. Uh, I hope that you take the opportunity to, to read some of the articles that I mentioned throughout the lecture. Um, here's the, the books, again, that I highly recommend, Dr. Craig, Dr. Franken, Dr. Duffin, and lots of great free webinars available now.
the ones in the Elevate series, I highly recommend to, to review all of them. Um, the ones preceding this were, the first was Dr. Matt Allen's on motivational interviewing, and then the second by Dr. Jeremy Horst. So those, it, they all just sort of build on one another. So it, I, I hope that you, if you have not already seen them, that to please watch those. And if you are newer to glass ion armor restoratives, I highly recommend these on-demand free webinars um, by Dr. Pamela, Dr. Doug, Dr. Brian. These are available on Viva Learning, and I gleaned pearls and tips from, from each of them to help me perfect my technique for this material because it, it was not part of my formal training. Which brings us to the end of this, this webinar. Thank you so much for, for listening, and I uh, just want everyone to know that I'm thinking about you, and you know we're all in this together. Uh, and I look forward to getting back to my practice and getting back to my work family and seeing my patients again. And I just want to, us to remember that hope is the only thing stronger than fear. Thank you so much. So we're going to go ahead and jump through a couple of these questions here. All right. So the first one here says, if a patient presented to my practice who had undergone smart therapy at a different office, how could I properly differentiate between caries arrested with silver diamine fluoride and glass ionomer and recurrent decay when viewed radiographically? Can you differentiate between the glass ionomer and composite clinically? Oh, that's an excellent question. So, you know, one of the fears that uh, other providers have expressed to me is they worry, you know, if, if their smart treatment goes to another provider and they see dark, um, around the margins, uh, for example, um, that they might mistake it for recurrent caries and then want to replace the restoration. So I really spend a lot of time educating the patient and the parent because, of course, I'm pediatric, so you, you got to do both um, to warn them of that misconception and, and encourage them. Let's say they're, they move or they graduate from the practice, so they I want them to understand that they have had silver diamond fluoride and I want them to understand the, stain, the staining. Um, so that a new pair of eyes doesn't misconstrue <laughs> what they're looking at. Um, but, you know, honestly, this is really no different than anything else we do. I, I'm, I've always been pretty conservative, especially for interproximal lesions and watching things over time before, you know, drooling and filling them. Is, uh, um, where, you know, something that I might feel comfortable, let's say like an E1, E2, um, non-cavitated proximal lesion, something that I perhaps have watched for years and years, you know, some of our kiddos that graduate um, because now they're in, they're in college and they're going to a new practice, sometimes the new dentist will say, oh my gosh, we got to do MODs on every single one of these little, you know, teeny tiny E1, E2, two lesions. Um, so, you know, a new set of eyes is always going to look at it differently. Um, now, Dr. Doug Young has a fabulous explanation um, radiographically, like if you're looking at the dentin, you know, as long as the margins are sealed, carbs <laughs> can't get in there, um, the, the lesion is going to arrest. So in, in the dentin, it might still look radiolucent radiographically, um, but it's not going to increase in over time, if that makes sense. So maybe I could go back I probably can't go back to the image, but um, when you get the thumbnails, if you look at those examples that I gave you, that I followed those two uh, five-year-olds with occlusal smarts for two years, you can see how um, the dentin looks over time. And sometimes you actually see some reparative dentin between, or tertiary dentin between the pulp um, and the curious lesion. Um, I, I will say that glass onomer sometimes will look more like natural enamel radiographically, uh, not as strikingly bright white um, as, say, a resin composite. All right. Um, are there any contraindications to using silver diamine fluoride as far as concerning medical history? You know, really none, <laughs> unless you had a silver allergy, but there's really no true uh, documented cases of silver allergy in the medical literature. All right. Is it better to use a light cured glass animal or a self care? I prefer a self care because um, that's going to release the most minerals and the most fluoride. Um, but let's say you have a wiggly kid. For example, my conventional class two, I use an RMGI. I use the Fuji 2LC because I can light cure it and take the, uh, the matrix band out quickly and then um, adjust it. 
uh, without having to worry about longer setting times or, or possibly um, moving the band too soon and, and, and disturbing the material while it's setting. Um, so it really just depends on the scenario. But generally speaking, uh, for long-term durability and best mechanical physical pro properties, I prefer the glass hybrids, so like an Equia Forte. Okay, and then um, thoughts on smart fillings on permanent teeth. You can do them on permanent teeth too. <laughs> But again, you don't have to do SDF first. Now, if you have a phobic pa patient, or let's say they have four quads of restorative and you need to put out the fire, sure, you could do SMART. But let's say you just have one little occlusal. Um, like, for example, my teenagers and college students, they have one little occlusal. I'll do ART. And you saw the meta-analyses that on permanent molars, they were we, they fared just as well as a conventional um, amalgam. So you can definitely do it on permanent teeth. All right, great. A couple of questions came in about when to apply the polyacrylic acid at like what step? So you would do that prior to placing the, the glass. I, I, I bet they're alluding to same day smart. I personally don't do a lot of same day smart and, and Dr. Um, Doug Young and I kind of do it a little bit differently, but, but generally speaking, I put SDF at the exam and I do a two-stage smart just because I happen to be in um, a private practice setting where we, we typically see these kiddos from the time they're toddlers until they go off to, to college. So I have that um, follow-up. Um, but, you know, if you're in a, a setting, let's say you're in a FQHC or, a, you know, some sort of public health setting where that might be your one and only time to see the patient, you could do conventional art and there's high levels of evidence for it. Um, if you want to do SDF, like some people will say that's a belt and a suspender, <laughs> you can you can do it. Um, but there, you are going to get different opinions on whether to put SDF before or after the, the conditioner. So I would say look at my stuff and, and read Dr. Young's article. I think, you know, there, there's two ways to, and we don't really know who's right or wrong. All right, great. A lot of other questions came in asking um, if you can place SDF and glass hammer for class two lesions. I do apply SDF proximally. Uh, are, are they talking about smaller incipient lesions? But yeah, you could you could place them with a micro brush or with uh, something like super floss or unwaxed floss proximally and, and watch those over time. You know, in, in my four hour presentation, I go through proximal use of, of SDF, but this was really geared toward art um, and smart. But you can definitely use glass. I showed a, a class two Equia Forte filling I did on a permanent molar. Um, yeah, you can definitely use glass for class twos. Um, but it has to be the right material. I, you know, I would use a glass hybrid like the Equia Forte has um, expanded uh, usage indications for stress bearing, whereas something like an RMGI, you might feel more or faster wear, you know. So that is something I would use on a primary class two, but I would not use an RMGI on a, um, a permanent class two. You could use it as a liner or a base in the sandwich technique and put a resin composite over it. Um, but I would not bulk fill an RMGI for a permanent class two. All right. And then when using that floss technique interproximal, um, so people are asking about if you've had any um, of that tattoo on the cheeks and gums or any significant tattooing in general. When I first was uh, starting out using the treatment, um, that's the few times that I did accidentally get it on a patient's lip. But what I do now is I'll put Vaseline on their lips as a barrier. Um, and then I'm just really careful not to dangle the floss over their lip. But if it accidentally gets on them, um, you can clean it off uh, with a slurry of salt and water or hydrogen peroxide. Um, so I'll do that or I'll tell the parents that they could do that at home if it's, if it's a pediatric patient who say moves and wiggles and then we accidentally get it on them. Um, maybe we could do a future presentation of proximal treatment. How's that sound? Because <laughs> right now I'm like, oh, I wish I could just show you examples of success and failure in the technique, but I don't have it at my fingertips for you. That's okay. All right. Um, looks like kind of looking over all of them, there's two more common themes here. So how do you convince parents for SDF on anterior teeth for young children? Oh, but we just have a good informed consent discussion. And if you, if you look at the literature, if, if the alternative is sedation, the majority of parents, even in the anterior, will pick the SDF. 
And I will show them, I use that chair side guide that I showed that you can download for patient education and I show them pictures of what it's gonna look like. Um, and it's interesting to see the reaction because some of them are like, oh, that's nothing, that's fine. You know, and others are like, ooh. <laughs> so the reaction is, ooh. You know, because sometimes they're okay with it in the molars, but maybe not for the anterior. In that case, I would do something else. Like for example, the Equia Forte strip crowns, or I might just do art um, in the anterior. Um, or varnish or MI paste or, or something else uh, in an attempt not to discolor the anterior teeth if they're really um, opposed to it. But generally speaking, um, in young patients, um, if, the, if the alternative is sedation, the majority of parents choose SDF as, a, as an option. All right, great. And then last question here is about using this for hyper, um, hypermineralized molars. Yeah. Um, so on this slide, hopefully you can see that, but on the right hand side, I have an article that addresses that in detail. And this is an open access article you can get from Decisions in Dentistry. It's the November 2018 um, issue. And I show step-by-step -step how to do um, a SMART for, for MIH and show you um, some clinical cases. Um, but it, it's really incredible how well, SDF will desensitize a tooth affected by MIH. Um, you know, in my full presentation, I also show a variety of um, levels of severity of, of MIH because sometimes it can be mild, moderate, or severe. Um, so one of the misconceptions is that it's going to somehow stain the entire tooth, and, th and that's not, not the case. It's only going to stain active carious lesions. Um, so actually, if you think back to that really severe anterior case where I did SDF only, remember really early on in today's presentation, if you look back at those images, let me see if I can jump to that. Um, it's probably too far back, but you could you could see on there, there was some hypomineralized calcified enamel that had either arrested or there was not an active carious lesion. So it, it didn't stain. And then in a molar, you know, if it's just in the fissured grooves, you could cover it with an opaque glass animal restorative and it would mask the discoloration. But way in the back, in the back of the mouth, typically you can't really see it. So parents do appreciate that minimally invasive option, especially if the alternative is gonna be sedation and a stainless steel crown or sedation and um, extraction of a permanent molar to do second molar substitution. Um, you know, the, the example I give in that article um, the boy could barely even brush his teeth. He was in so much pain. He was having trouble eating um, and brushing. And we did SDF a couple of times and that completely alleviated his sensitivity. Um, and then we did the, the Equia Forte as, as a smart restoration. Um, but you know, when you present a, to a parent about their child's permanent molar and you're saying a crown or an action, they kind of freak out, you know, their eyes glaze over. Meanwhile, that child's eating. You know, you want to do something to get them stable and to get them cold. And STF is, is an awesome first line treatment for that because it's so quick and simple and inexpensive. A lot of plans now cover it, um, the, the use of STF under 1354. Um, so it, it's, it's wonderful, especially for people who are new to STF. I think that's a great starter <laughs> case to use it for that. And, um, you know, it, it, it's amazing. All right, and we did have one last kind of theme here is if you can share your protocol when using silver diamine fluoride on how many applications and how far you space those applications out. So typically speaking, I'll place it at the diagnostic exam, whether that's a recare or a new patient exam. And if it's a cavity lesion on an uncooperative or apprehensive patient, I like to have them back in at least two weeks, two to four weeks and assess there's that picture I was talking about. Can you appreciate the, the discoloration, the hypomineralization on this tooth, but the whole thing didn't stain black. Hopefully you can see that. Um, anyhow, um, so typically I'll put it at the exam. If it's cavitated, uh, I'll have them back in two to four weeks, assess the lesion um, and assess the behavior. If the behavior is better, like I, let's say I've built their trust and desensitized the tooth, I can place a glass bottom or restoration and I don't even reapply the SDF. Um, 
if there's still little Tasmanian devils, then I'll see them in six months and see how it's looking, take an x-ray, uh, reapply it if, if cooperation still isn't there. Or let's say it's um, anterior. So this is a great example here. See my breakdown? Um, those are pretty large lesions on anterior. So I, I placed it at the initial exam, had him back in a month, and then he came back six months later, and then another six months later. So a total of four applications. And by that final application, the lesions were shiny and hard, which indicates the rest. So that, that was the end <laughs> of his SDF treatment. Now, if those were ever to change, like let's say they um, became soft or dull, uh, then I would uh, assess and either do a restoration or initiate SDF again. Um, but these, those have not changed in that time. All right, great. Well, thanks for taking some additional time here to answer some questions. And like we said, we will certainly have this recording up for everyone to be able to listen back in if the audio did indeed cut out. And just a reminder, that um, CE certificates will be emailed out to attendees in approximately 7 to 14 days. And then keep a lookout because next week we've got some more live webinars. Um, Dr. Horse will be back again to do a little deeper dive into clinical dentistry. And then there will be another webinar that will be covering teledentistry, which I know you mentioned a little bit here, Dr. McLean, as well. Mm -hmm. and if you guys can just be sure to like and follow us on Elevate Oral or Elevate Oral Care on Facebook and Instagram. That's how you can keep up to date on any upcoming programs and the registration links will be provided for you guys there as well. Or you can always reach out to our customer service with any questions at 877-866-9113. So thank you so much everybody and have a wonderful day.